you're about to see is a real-life story taken from the files of the police racket and bunco squads, business protective associations, and similar sources all over the country. It is intended to expose the confidence game, the carefully worked out frauds by which confidence men take more money each year from the American public than all the bank robbers and thugs with their violence. Braddock, ready. What you're about to see is a thrilling, dramatic, real-life story taken from the official files of the police racket and bunco squads, business protective associations, and similar sources all over the country. It is presented by Philip Morris as a public service to expose the confidence game, the carefully worked out frauds by which confidence men take more money each year from the American public than all the bank robbers and thugs with their violence. Would you believe that some of us are still buying such time-worn commodities as the Brooklyn Bridge, Niagara Falls, a device to make high-test ethyl gasoline out of ordinary rainwater, and the latest, stock shares in the gold at Fort Knox? Well, you can believe it. As this gentleman and authority will tell you, it happens all the time. Commodore Stitch, when did you last sell the Brooklyn Bridge? It was a Golden Gate Bridge. It wasn't too long ago. And uh, where did you spend the following summers, Commodore? I believe it was at a bay resort called uh, San Quentin, but the rates were too high. And in all your deals, Commodore, how much money did you take in? Oh, I never kept track. The uh, newspapers say it was in excess of five million dollars. Five million. But you know, some of the switches put over on adults wouldn't have fooled a seven-year-old child. Personally, I never tried to cheat an honest man. You mean the person who attempts to get something for nothing, a lot for a little, is more vulnerable? <laughs> I think that explains it very well. And your one more dream man was such a person? A perfect example. Oh, my prize pigeon. Do you know of anyone who would believe the story? The story just mentioned by our visitor would make an ingenious premise for a musical farce. But as a scene out of everyday life, you may find it extremely difficult to believe. But it did happen. To our friend the Commodore and to a money-hoarding millionaire whom we shall call Mr. Titus Mealy. It began at a time when Commodore Stitch was traveling the Oregon short line. Con lingo, this means during a period when the Commodore was financially frustrated. That's my magazine. Know anything about clairvoyance, mister? Huh? No. You wouldn't. You don't look like you'd know anything. Cannibal. How's prison? Very good. After observing some of the gluttony around here, I don't see how you can manage to stay in business serving all the food you can get for 50 cents. I've wondered about it myself. It's like feeding time at the zoo. All we need is a few growls. <laughs> I take that character over there. How often does he eat here? He's always at the same table, three times a day. Three times a day? Every day. I still don't see why you don't go bankrupt. If I were the owner of this restaurant, I'd pay him to stay away. The funny part of it is that he can afford ten of these restaurants and still have a couple of million dollars left over. Titus Mealy, eccentric multimillionaire. Today told the Times Herald reporter that he was merely following the advice of his psychic consultants who... I give up. As of this moment, Titus Mealy was a gone goose. The Commodore quickly organized his team and was now ready to proceed with the carefully rehearsed steps necessary in the fleecing of a mark, or sucker.
The volume, Adventure and Clairvoyance, with the exception of chapter three, was authentic. The distinguished looking gentleman on the front piece was a fraud, our old friend, Commodore Stitch. In a few seconds, you will witness one of the more important steps in the big con, in which Kay Wilson, known to her co-workers and to the police as Salvation Sal, will attempt to rope or steer Mr. Mealy by telling him the tale, baiting him for the Commodore's trap. I beg your pardon. That book you're reading, it belongs to me. Can you prove it? Now, see here. Uh, no use getting indignant about it, young lady. I asked you a simple question. That book is mine. I left it here. Please let me have it. How do I know it's yours? Because you say so? Because it was autographed to me by the author, Heinrich von Rinke. What's your name? Catherine Wallace. Sit down, young lady. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, I'm afraid not, you see. Uh, just for a few moments, I'd like to talk to you about the book. Well, just for a few moments. I was fascinated by the title of Chapter 3. And yet there are scoffers who put clairvoyance in the same category as fortune-telling. Not me. Why, in 1929, I got a premonition that a crash was coming. So what did I do? I sold short, made me a fortune. Yes, sir. I believe what Von Rinker says in this chapter. The day is not far off when a highly psychic individual will be able to project his thoughts, his dreams, past, present, and future on a screen like a motion picture. A man like that could become as rich as Croesus in no time. Maybe the day is already here. I'm sorry, I, I really must be going. Did I, did I say something that offended you? I can't discuss the subject with you any further. Is it that I stumbled onto something? You can trust me, Miss Wallace. When can I meet Von Rinke? Herr Von Rinke is in Europe. When he returns, he'll be too occupied to talk to anyone. How long will he be in Europe? Just long enough to raise funds for his new work. His new work, eh? Perhaps I can help him financially. Oh, uh, don't let appearances fool you, Miss Wallace. The meekness of the mighty. And here I was feeling sorry for you. No, I'm not poor, and I'd like to help Von Rinker. He won't accept financial aid from you or any other individual, Mr. Mealy. Suppose he doesn't get any help in Europe. What then? It would just delay his work that much longer. He's no longer young. Then we've got to help him in spite of himself. But how? Suppose I was to head a scientific group. Call it the uh, Institute of uh, Metaphysical Research. Put all the bills myself. Kay Wilson has now skillfully maneuvered Mr. Mealy into a spot where he's not only begging to be fleeced, he is also furnishing the device. Mr. Mealy was now firmly on the hook. The next step was giving him the breakdown, determining exactly for how much he could be taken. Well, how large a tub would you say Titus Mealy is good for? Beats me. For a character who dresses as he does and eats in beaneries, I doubt if we'll even get a sawbuck out of him. He's good for a hundred Gs, if not more. I've given him a good canvas. He's a pushover for horoscopes, fortune tellers, anything that will give him an edge in adding more of the filthy lucre to his already swollen millions. But wait till he gets a load of that dynamic thought projector. <laughs> I lay six, two, and even right now. But the first thing he will ask for is a tip on the stock market and uh, the winner of the Kentucky Derby. That's Mealy. Benny. You better phone your friend at Associated Press right now. Come in, Mr. Mealy. Miss Wallace, I intend to spend the rest of the evening in the laboratory. I do not wish to be disturbed. What's the matter with him? He's been in a horrible mood all day. Guess his European trip must have been a washout, huh? 
complete failure. They laughed at what he's trying to do. The dynamic thought projection? Just as they laughed at Shark, Nesmith, Freud, and others who dared to venture into the unexplored regions of the mind. Miss Wallace, if Von Rinker will give me a demonstration of thought projection on a screen right here and now, I'll back him to the extent of a hundred thousand dollars more, if necessary. Such a demonstration is completely out of the question, Mr. Mealy. You know better than that, Miss Wallace. A hundred thousand dollars is an enormous sum, Mr. Mealy. What prompts you to do this? I like to help people. Wait, please. I told you distinctly I do not wish to be disturbed. I will not have you shouting at me this way. You make me shout. I never shout. Has he erased the Andy? Herr von Rinker, just this once, please. All right. For you, I do it. A demonstration of clairvoyance. Nothing else. Step into the laboratory, please, Mr. Mealy. You are falling into a deeper and deeper sleep. You are falling... You will pay no attention to outside disturbances. You hear only my voice, soothing, soothing. You're falling into a deeper and deeper sleep. 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 The subject has reached the fifth degree of hypnosis. This is known as somnambulism. He's now able to see and perceive independently of the physical sense of sight, to see beyond the veil of eternity into the past, present, and future. Due to this repeated experiments, the subject is approaching a state of clairvoyant exhaustion. To continue without purpose, will destroy 10 years of painstaking efforts and research. However, I will permit him to answer two questions, which you will write on this index card. Actually, the Commodore had palmed the index card containing Mealy's questions. And was now passing it to a Confederate on the other side of the wall. Are you asleep? You may talk. Are you asleep? Yes, I am asleep. Your powers of concentration are infinite. For you, there's no distance, no space, no time, no resistance. A visitor has asked two questions, which you must answer. What is the first question? I repeat, what is the first question? question. Is there Wall Street stock due for a sensational decline within the next few months? What is the answer to this first question? There is such a decline imminent. Ask him the name of the stock. Bulgarian. What is the visitor's second question? He wishes to know the winner of the Kentucky Derby. What is the answer to this second question? It is very difficult for me to see that far into the future. I begin to see a name. Now it fades. 
I no longer see it. It brought to mind a city in the Midwest, also of that name. Omaha! I'll put down a little bet for you too, Professor. Silence! Was the name of the horse Omaha? I cannot say for certain it faded too soon. Due to the lack of finance, it may take some time before the apparatus is perfected so that the distant future will be as of the present. The subject is already oriented. It is now the mechanical phase which must coordinate. However, the past is no enigma, nor is the immediate future. You hear only my voice. Your mind is relaxed, passive. You're in full control of the five senses. Your powers of concentration are infinite. Can you predict something of importance which we do not yet know? It's all very dim. Wall Street. Heavy trading in the exchange. Near panic in the stock market. You will now let your thought currents wander deep into the past and bring to our visitor a scene he has long forgotten. I see an old two-story frame house surrounded by shrubs and cottonwood trees. Over the front door of the house, I see a horseshoe on one of the cottonwood trees, I can clearly see two carved out initials. The initials are T.M. Do you recognize this scene? It's, it's the old farmhouse in Kansas where I was born. I know just how you feel, Mr. Mealy. No, you don't. They discovered oil on the property right after I sold it. Was Mealy convinced he was looking at the house in which he was born? It was the house he was born in. <laughs> I took it from a photo right out of Mealy's family album. He was convinced, all right. And is that when he parted with his first hundred thousand? Oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't that easy. You see, Mealy wanted immediate tips on the stock market, fights, horse races. So I managed to fix a few small ones but I knew it couldn't go on indefinitely. I wanted something else fast to put him on the big scent, and I got it. Well, what was it? Through Katie Wilson, he was told that the real reason for my experiments with Van was that I almost perfected an engine which would run without fuel of any kind. And that one, he bit hard. <laughs> Good to see you, Mr. Mealy. What is it now? More money? I have wonderful news. Let me be the judge of that. We've reached the final step in the perfection of the motor. If everything goes right, we'll be finished tonight. Well, just one more dream, eh, Miss Wallace? Exactly. One more dream. And all of our hopes will be realized. I'm ready, Miss Wallace. I need not remind you that we are on the threshold of a great discovery. Should the atom eventually be split, which I doubt, it still would not dim what's about to transpire here in a matter of few moments. I must warn you also that the subject is close to the exhaustion point. And since this requires the ultimate in concentration and exercises unbelievable strain, I will ask you to remain completely silent while we are in progress. Your phenomenal powers of concentration are infinite. For you, there is no distance, 
no space, no time, no resistance. See clearly what heretofore has been a labyrinth of confusion. Transmit this phenomenon so that we also may see. Transmit this phenomenon so that we also may see. Transmit this phenomenon so that we also may see. but under the circumstances, I must step up the voltage. What is it? I was afraid this would happen. Oh, the work of life. What do you mean? Subject has developed insomnia. What? Clairvoyant insomnia, the work of a lifetime ruined. Ruined. Well, do something. Nothing we can do. Step up the voltage. And cause a cranial hemorrhage that will constitute murder. Then I'll do it myself. No, Mr. Miller, you can't. Don't tell me what I can't do, young woman. I got a fortune invested here and it's got to pay off. is dead. Assassin. Murderer. Held for manslaughter, and with Kay pleading with the Commodore to call it accidental, Mealy was more than happy to contribute an additional $50,000 to the subject's widow. Yeah, the old boy will really flip his lid when he learns he's been rooked. You'll get it back soon enough. Yeah? How? As long as they are helpless widows and gullible spinsters, he'll do all right. And when did Mealy first tumble to the hoax? Oh, about a year later, when he ran into the real Van Rinker in Vienna. You know, it's amazing that he should be taken in by such an obvious swindle. Mealy had a blind spot. Most of us do. He told me what it was. The rest was easy. Mm-hmm. And uh, what are you doing now, Commodore, to occupy your time? <laughs> I am a babysitter. Well, you can't do any business there. No, you can't fool babies. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't fool babies. And judging from the reports that are brought to me every day, people are just begging to be fooled, providing they can be made to feel they're getting something for nothing, a lot for a little. And unless you are forever on your guard, the same thing that happened to Titus Mealy can happen to you. In a moment, we'll call for a few scenes from next week's case. But first, some places in tonight's story have been changed for obvious reasons. And any resemblance to other people and places is purely coincidental. Our story is presented to expose the confidence game and is never intended to reflect in any way upon honest, legitimate businessmen. every Monday night when Philip Morris presents My Little Margie, starring Gail Storm and Charles Farrell over most of these same stations. For delayed telecasts, 
See your local television listings for time and station.